Chemical equilibrium is when the forward and reverse reactions of a reversible reaction happen at the exact same rate. Visually, we see no change, but atomically, there is a huge amount of chemical change happening as these products and reactants switch places back and forth. Now, chemical equilibrium, once established, will actually want to stay that way. And there's an important rule in chemical equilibrium called Le Chatelier's Principle, which states that when a system at equilibrium is stressed, equilibrium will shift to minimize that stress. So basically, when a system gets to equilibrium, it's going to try its best to stay at equilibrium. If you throw it off its equilibrium in some way, it will actually respond accordingly. Think back to the example that I talked about of running on a treadmill. As you run on a treadmill, you are traveling the same forward rate that the treadmill is moving backwards. And this is you at equilibrium. The only thing is, imagine somebody comes along and hits the up button on the speed. You all of a sudden have to respond in order to stay at equilibrium. So you are going to speed up in response to make this happen. If someone were to press the down button and slow down the treadmill, you also have to slow down so you don't run right off of it. And so you respond to stay at equilibrium. Well, chemicals do the same thing, but they actually do it based on collision theory and based on rates. And we're going to take a look at how this can actually take place by working through some examples. So this is the example that we have here where iron 3 plus is reacting with the thiocyanate ion to produce what's called a thiocyanato ion or FeSCN2 plus. This is a system that we are going to say is at equilibrium. And we're going to walk through what happens when we have some kind of stress that takes place. The stress that we are going to work with is very first by adding Fe3+. So basically we are going to add Fe3+, into this solution. Now the initial stress here is that the concentration of Fe3+, goes up. Now, the next thing we should think about is what does this actually do to the solution? Well, you've added more of this. So these two reactants are actually going to collide together more often. That's going to cause the forward reaction to start running faster than the reverse reaction. And that is what we would call a shift to the right. You may also hear people talk about it as a shift towards the products. And that is basically saying that because there is more reactants than there should be at equilibrium, it's going to speed up the forward rate and end up producing more of the product. But as it starts producing more of the product, it's actually using up this substance in order to do it this substance is actually reacting with the Fe and turning into FeSCN. Remember, this is all in one big container happening at one time. You can't just add to the left side or to the right side. You'd actually dump it all into one container. That will speed up your forward reaction, shift to the right, produce more FeSCN, and use up the SCN minus in order to actually produce this stuff. And it will do this until the new rates become equal again. All because we added one substance to it. So that's one example of how concentration can affect a solution. So let's take a look at how we could change it again. Let's look at a second example. And this time we are going to, let's say we add FeSCN2 plus to the solution. So what's the initial stress here? Well, the initial stress is that the concentration of FeSCN has increased. So what's happening in the solution? You now have extra products and increased concentration. Think back to the kindergartner model. Too many of these will cause more collisions, which will cause this uh, rate of reaction to speed up. 
and the reverse rate is the one that's actually speeding up here. That's going to cause a shift to the left or a shift to the reactants. And that's all because there's an increased amount of this causing more collisions, speeding up that reverse rate. And what that's going to do is actually make more of the reactants. As this stuff breaks down and turns into these things, it's actually going to end up making more of them. And as a result, the concentration of everything has actually increased over the rate of this reaction. And again, that's all due to the rates. It's just about the collisions and which things are actually being more concentrated and having more collisions because of that. Now, this is an example of what happens with concentration. Let's take a look at another example related to concentration, but let's do something a little bit different, but we're going to have to clear away some of this work in order to do it. So now that we have a clear board, what we're going to do is we are going to have a new stress, but this time what we're going to do is we are going to decrease the amount of something. Let's decrease the amount of SCN minus. So what's that going to do? Well, initial stress. SCN minus has to decrease. This is our initial stress on the solution. Now, again, think about collisions. Think about what's happening inside the big container with all of this stuff inside. Less of this means less collisions of Fe3 plus and SCN minus. So this reaction that is going forward is now actually going slower. So what that means is this one is going faster. What we have here is a shift to the left. And as it shifts to the left, this stuff is actually going to be used up in order to produce more of the SCN that was lost. It will also end up producing more Fe3 plus because you're using this stuff up and making more of this. Keep in mind what Le Chatelier's principle is. When an equilibrium system experiences stress, there will be a shift in order to respond to it. Less SCN means that equilibrium will try and fix the loss of SCN. So that is how concentration has an effect. An increase in concentration will cause a shift away from the increase. A decrease in concentration will cause a shift towards the increase. So now that we understand concentration, let's take a look at pressure and volume. So when it comes to pressure and volume, I think it's important again to consider what it actually means to change the pressure in a solution or mixture. Think about that piston again and drive that piston upwards and that is going to cause a decrease in volume. Remember, a increase in pressure is the exact same thing as a decrease in volume. Those are equivalent. So an increase in pressure is the same as a decrease in volume. If you were to think about this the other way, a decrease in pressure is an increase in volume. When there is an increase in pressure and less volume to work in, what's going to happen in equilibrium is that the solution is going to try to shift to the side that has less moles of gas. So when there is this increase, it will shift to less moles of gas. Now, the reason why, think about gas takes up a lot of space. And so by compressing the volume, the system is basically trying to fit things into a smaller space. By getting rid of some gas, then you don't have as much space being taken up. Any gas at standard temperature and pressure takes up 22.4 liters of space per mole. So that's a lot of room. And by increasing the pressure, if you can switch to maybe half of the amount of gas, then it will be much easier to fit it into that space. So here's what we're going to take a look at is 
let's say our initial stress here is that we increase the pressure. So we increase pressure. I'm just going to abbreviate pressure with P. Now, to figure out what's going to go on here, we need to figure out how many moles of gas are on each side of the equation. So on the left, we have two moles of gas. But on the right, we only have one mole of gas. The two I got from the coefficient and the gas I knew because of the state. Here there's only a coefficient of one and the gas is the state. Now if let's say this was a solid, that would actually be zero moles of gas, so keep that in mind. So what's going to happen here? Well, the shift is going to be to less moles of gas. So the shift is going to be to the right. That's going to cause an increase in the amount of N2O4 and decrease in the amount of NO2. And that's all because less moles of gas is what it shifts to when there is an increase in pressure. Now, if there was a decrease in pressure, it will shift to the side with more moles of gas. So let's just work through that example quickly. Let's say there was a decrease in pressure in this solution. Well, what's going to happen? It's going to shift to the side that has more gas to try and fill up the extra space that has been made. So it's going to shift to the left. That's going to make more of this because it's speeding up that forward reaction. That's going to cause a decrease in the amount of here, of, of products. Again, we can think about this in terms of collisions. When we increase that pressure, you actually have more molecules, more moles colliding with each other. That's going to speed up that forward reaction and end up producing more of that stuff. Whereas if you were to give more space, then that allows that other reaction to actually speed up. So in order to understand pressure and volume, just remember increase in pressure, less moles of gas, decrease in pressure, more moles of gas. So now that we've seen that, we're going to clear this up and we are going to move on to take a look at temperature. Now, to do this, we're going to take a look at this chemical reaction here. Now, those of you who are well versed in chemistry know this isn't really a reversible reaction, but you know what? We're just going with it as an example because it still works whether it's reversible or not. We're just going to pretend that it is. So what's happening here is we have these two substances reacting to produce these things. And we're given the information that this is exothermic. How do I know it's exothermic? Well, I know that because it's negative. Delta H is negative. And let's say that we are going to increase the temperature. Now, I think a lot of people try and memorize this because there are some really complicated rules about temperature. And I think there's a much easier way to do this. The way that I think you should do this is rewrite this equation, but actually put the heat value into the equation. So what that means is we are going to have CH4 as a gas, O2 as a gas, producing carbon dioxide as a gas, and water as a gas. But because the delta H is negative and it's exothermic, that means that the heat is also a product. It is given off. And so when you actually write it into the equation, and now we think about our increase in temperature, you can almost think about it as if it were a part of the equation. The increase in temperature is essentially the stress. And now you can treat it just like concentration and think, okay, I have too much of this stuff. It's going to shift away. That's going to produce more of my reactants. And it's going to decrease my amount of products. So this is my tip. If you are dealing with a reversible reaction and Le Chatelier's principle, and it tells you there's a change in temperature, include the heat term in the equation. 
and it will help you figure out what's going on. Now that you've seen this example, let's do another one, but let's do one that's exo or endothermic instead of exothermic. So I'm just going to clear this away. Okay, so let's take a look at this example. We have PCl5 in a reversible reaction with PCl3 and Cl2. So we have this equilibrium system. It tells us that delta H is positive 67. Positive 67, well, that should tell you right away, positive endothermic. And so if we're dealing with a shift because of Le Chatelier's principle, let's write this into the equation. Because it is endothermic, you need to write it with the reactants. Remember, endothermic means energy is taken in. That means it goes on the reactant side of the equation. So then we rewrite our equation out, and now we need to think about the actual stress that is happening on this system. The decrease in temperature basically means the amount of energy is going down on this side. So that's our initial stress. To respond, equilibrium is going to shift towards that to fill in what was lost. That means the amount of PCL5 is going to increase, the amount of PCL3, and the amount of Cl2 are going to decrease. So this is what happens when we're dealing with a substance and a change in temperature during a reversible equilibrium reaction. The last thing that affects the rate of a reaction is a catalyst, but a catalyst actually lowers the activation energy, and in the terms of a reversible reaction, it actually speeds up both the reverse and the forward reaction. And because both are sped up, it's actually no effect on equilibrium. And I think the best way to demonstrate this is to take a look at an energy diagram and see the effect when we add a catalyst. So here I have two reactions written out. My red represents my uncatalyzed reaction. So just the standard reaction happening as it normally would. And my blue dotted line represents the catalyzed version, so where a catalyst was added. What you can see is that we've lowered the activation energy. That's what catalysts do. And that makes the forward reaction be able to happen more quickly because there's less energy for it to overcome. But keep in mind, it's actually made it easier for the reverse reaction to happen as well because you've decreased its activation energy. See, when we talked about energy diagrams, we talked about how there is an activation energy from the peak or the transition state to the reactants. But keep in mind, now that we're dealing with a reversible reaction, we also have an activation energy for that reverse as well. And by lowering the activation energy, you've actually lowered the activation energy for both the forward and reverse reactions, which means they both go faster, and there is actually no shift in equilibrium when we add a catalyst. So those are the ways that equilibrium can be affected by adding different things, and how Le Chatelier's tells us that it will respond to all of those stresses. So thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.